Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. General Hawk, congratulations to you. I want to follow up on uh, two points that were raised by my colleague, Senator Manchin, budgets and allies. So on budgets, may maybe particularly with some colleagues here, um, we could get rid of the most commonly occurring CRs immediately if we would switch the federal budget year from October 1 to January 1. If you look at when we actually get appropriations deals done over the last 30 years, we never get them done by September 30. We almost always get them done in December. Why is that? It's because our leaders basically, at the end of the year, when people want to go spend time with their family, say we're not going home until we get appropriations bills done. Now, every once in a while we go into the following year, but usually we're getting them done right when we leave. If we switch the federal fiscal year to a January 1, December 31 fiscal year, that's, that pressure would still be on us. I don't think we would say, well, let's do it at the end of March. I think the leadership would still force us to do it. This has become such a norm here that even in the debt ceiling deal that we just did, we imposed a set of punishments on ourselves if we didn't get the deal done by December 31. We all know that that's the real time now. And I just think we could eliminate an awful lot of the CR concern that Senator Manchin raised if we would just analyze and then be honest about what is the real budget calendar up here. A friend of mine who was a landscape architect said, if you're doing a landscape, don't put down the sidewalks, do the landscape, then see where people walk, and they'll make a path and then build the sidewalks there. We are showing where the path is to budgets and getting rid of CR. So I'll just tell my colleagues, on September 30 this year, I'm going to introduce a bill to change the budget year to a calendar year. And if it turns out that we get a, a probe deal is done by September 30, I'll admit that I'm wrong, but I'm not going to be wrong, and I'm going to introduce that bill, and I would love anybody else joining me in it. I'm on the budget committee. I'd like to convince them to do that budget process change. General Hogg, um, Senator Manchin asked you about alliances, and I want to ask about a particular one. The NDAA that we're debating now on the floor will include provisions regarding the AUKUS framework. So this is a framework that has two pillars. Pillar one deals with uh, submarine technology, the working with the Australians to build up a nuclear submarine industrial base in the 2030s. That would involve some transfer of U.S. subs should we be able to kind of figure out the details right in the 2040s. The Australians would have their own submarine production capacity. But there's also pillar two of the AUKUS deal, which focuses upon cooperation with the UK and, and Australia on cyber, artificial intelligence, hypersonics, other advanced technologies. You talk generally about the work that we do in the, in the cyberspace with allies recognizing we're in an unclassified setting. Let's focus a little bit more on what you might see as upside opportunities in this framework with Australia and the UK. Uh, Senator, uh, in terms of our partners in the Indo-Pacific, Australia and New Zealand are clearly are, 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 have been long-standing allies. Two, two of the five eyes nations, so we have huge uh, equities with them. And, and then, of course, the UK and, and how we think about Europe and, and those partners. Um, our partnership with both Australia and the UK, both bilaterally and multilaterally, AUKUS presents another opportunity. And it presents us an opportunity to do that through the lens of the threat of the People's Republic of China. So from a pillar two perspective, opportunity for us to really think our way through how best as all three nations and all three militaries to think about those technologies. Great, thank you. Um, I noticed you're a Russian major, Russian studies major, and, and I wonder in the cyber field, I, I would think that language fluency would be a big component of trying to build out a, a good workforce, and you would be sensitive to that from that background, and I know within military speak, this is often called LREC, language, regional expertise, and culture as a kind of a strategic advantage for folks. How are you doing within Cyber Command in terms of building out a workforce that has, you know, language capacities to enable us to be at our best? Senator, we've done, we've done well. We, inside each one of our teams, uh, we do have language capability. Uh, different services have approached it through different ways and, and how they've grown that, whether through their cryptologic community uh, or additional training. 
it, it's an absolutely an incredibly important part of our force. And as we think about what our balance is, if confirmed, that'll also be the area that I look at in terms of the balance of which languages based off the threats we face today. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back.